Good evening everybody and I hope everybody's enjoying the wonderful weather we've got here. Um, just a couple of things, uh, just to go through the friendlies again really. Um, so all away at the moment, 5th of July Supermarine, 8th of July Malcham, 11th of July Corsham, then on the 18th of July which is Tuesday we've got two games, one in the afternoon versus Bristol City which is behind closed doors. Um, they're playing at the training ground as the picture's being uh, relayed. And then on the 22nd is um, away at Eastleigh. Um, we haven't heard anything about home games yet, um, but as soon as we will, they'll be on socials or we can put them out on here as well. Okay, so very much privileged to have Marcus Fjortoff on with us this evening. Um, he is on holiday actually, so it's uh, more uh, that he's uh, come on to us, which we're very pleased about. So let's get Vic on. Hi, Vic. Hi, Chris. How are you this evening? It's beautiful here Good. in Devon, I can tell you. The sun is shining. Gorgeous yeah. evening. Same here too. It's, well, we've been very lucky the past week or so, haven't we? So no complaining. So, so are you ready? Shall we bring? We Marcus are. On? We, we should say the playoffs have been fabulous. I mean, of course, this is the weekend celebrating Swindon's promotion yeah. up to uh, the Premiership. Of course, thirty years ago, believe it or not. But what a weekend of playoff action! And Sheffield Wednesday uh, gaining promotion to the Championship today with a last-minute winner. And we should say congratulations to Michael Smith, of course, the former town okay, striker yes. who played uh, for Sheffield Wednesday this afternoon. And uh, the bizarre coincidence is that Josh, um, oh God, Edwin, Josh Windash, that's his name, of course, scored yeah. the winner for Sheffield Wednesday, much as his dad, Dean Windash, did for Hull City against Bristol City in the playoffs at Wembley. Oh, what a coincidence. A few that years is. ago. Yeah. <laughs> a few years Good ago. Extraordinary thing, yes. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's a, that's a good one. Okay, let's bring Marcus on. Hi, Marcus. Hi, Chris. Hi, Vic. How are you? We're all good. good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, and thank you very much for taking the time to, to join us this evening. I know you're on holiday. but uh, No, my pleasure. I, I noticed that you guys were talking about how good the weather was in, in Swindon, so I got the sense that you're trying to one-up me or something like that. But uh, I can, uh, <laughs> I can say the, the, the sun is good here in, in Spain as well, but I'm glad we're both enjoying it. We Great. are indeed. Yeah, it's lovely here. It has been for a while, so it's good. Okay, so I'm going to leave you to it, Vic. So I will cut back to you shortly. Chris, thanks ever so much. Marcus, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. My, first and foremost, I mean, I, my goodness me, you're 29. What an incredible life you've had already. I mean, I, 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 if I'd done one zillionth of what you've done in 29 years, I'd be really pleased. But Oh, well, that's very kind of you. That's very kind to hear. No, uh, I guess 29 years marks also the last time you alluded to it there was Swindon last being in the Premiership as well. So if anything, I, if I can serve as a kind of a... Uh, a representative of how long it's been since winning were in the Premiership. I could fulfil that role gladly. Yeah, I won't ask you what you remember of that Wembley playoff final because clearly you don't. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to what you remember about the town shortly. But you might notice just behind me is a Hamilton academical scarf. I bizarrely support that team. It's my Scottish team. You, of course, <laughs> have played for them. Yeah. So there's a bit of a connection. I thought I'd put that up in your honour. Uh, Thank evening. you. So Thank you very much. I appreciate okay. it. It's been a tough season for them as well, unfortunately, but we don't have to go too much into that. No, they got relegated on penalties, uh, bizarrely enough. Um, penalties much in the news this weekend. Let's go right back to the beginning then, because you are a Swindonian. Um, indeed. indeed. So how much do you remember? How long were you in Swindon for? Well, admittedly, I think my dad signed in 93, didn't he? And so and left in, in 95 following that relegation. Um, and he went down and then he eventually left for, for Millsborough. And you mentioned there in the intro that Sheffield Wednesday beat Barnsley uh, yeah. in the playoff final, um, a club yes. that he also played for. Sheffield Wednesday being rivals of Sheffield United, who he also played for. Yes. Um, <laughs> but um, it's been one of those Vic, that uh, with Swindon, I was obviously very, very young. But I am a Swindonian. I was born there. Um, my dad speaks so warmly of Swindon. I know the fans speak warmly of him, and I've been fortunate enough to hear that in person when I've gone back for the commentary and for the for the latest game as well at County Ground. So for me, it's been one very much of those tracing back your tracks in a sense, you know, of, of kind of rediscovering 
a period of life in which you might not remember, simply because I was very, very, very young. But um, no, one of those that, despite being away from it for a long time and being able to go back to County Ground for the first time since I was one years old uh, earlier this year, it's uh, it's always had a special special connection for me. We'll ask you tales of Andrew Hawes a little bit later, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. <laughs> and that special hat that he wears. But, uh, yes. of course, that game you, you mentioned a few um, moments ago, I was lucky enough to be doing the commentary on that. And uh, you brought back the airplane celebration. That must have been a special moment for you. Yes, indeed. I mean, I, I, I don't think I did it as convincingly as he did. I was wary of the fact that it was his and, and all that. But, uh, yeah, of course, I wanted to, despite it being... Uh, you know, it was a competitive game at that, but it was a charity game and being able to, I, I did ask and the, to be fair, the players on the bench who I was with, they said, okay, get Marcus on for the last 10 minutes. And I said, yeah, I, I, I need less than 10, I said a bit, uh, maybe too confidently, but uh, I was able to score and then I was able to do this airplane celebration. Of course, that's a trademark celebration of my father. It's a trademark uh, time in his career that I'm very proud of. And it's one of those, the older you get, the more you're able to put into context and say, you know what, that's that was that was a special time, and I think he was proud to see me go back to Swindon and do that and be connected back with the club that he enjoys such a good relationship with. I, I listened to your podcast earlier um, regarding the Oliver Kahn situation, which you did with your dad. Yes, which is a fascinating podcast. We'll talk about what you do a little later on, but it, it's lovely that you've got that connection regarding German football. Another exciting weekend there, of course, this Definitely. weekend. So we'll Definitely. get to that a little later. But let's let's. I mean, many people might not know this, but you you've played in a lot of places. You played in Norway. You've played in America. You've played in New Zealand. You've played in mm -hmm. Scotland. How did it all start then? Well, for me, I was I lived my first five years in England and uh, and then in Germany. So from the very beginning, I had a very international background. I think you are a product of your parents and your surroundings. I've been fortunate enough, and I say that from the bottom of my heart, that my parents are my two biggest role models, both with different qualities, both with different <laughs> paths and, and, and what have you. But ever since the very beginning, I've had a very international exposure, which I've been fortunate enough to have. And so when I went to Norway, I went to an international school and, and my parents valued that. So when I came to a, um, one of those decisions, when you're 18, 19, and you start to be a bit like, where can I go in football? I realized, okay, I might not become captain of Arsenal or Real Madrid or play for them or what have you. So what can I do as an alternative? Uh, how can I have as cool of a football career as my dad maybe, but maybe in a different way. And for me, the answer was America. Um, I'd gone all the, the youth levels in, in, in Norway and felt that football, I love football, but um, as predicated by my father and my mother, education was an important bit of it. And so there's no better place, in my opinion, than American colleges because you have a fantastic professional setup with a good education and it's all set up for you. And I thought, you know, it would be cool if after four year, those four years, I could get drafted in MLS. That would be that was kind of the the carrot, uh, if that's the way you say it. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to go to a, a rather good school. Um, and in that, in those four years, which I would say is one of those really life defining moments, I was able to uh, get my get my bachelor's and my master's, and. Um, and then do well enough to get drafted by the Seattle Sounders. Fortunately, that didn't work out uh, for different reasons, you know, part external, part internal. Um, but with that kind of, for me, if I stopped playing after that, my football life would have been a success. And I was 24 years old at the time. And quite frankly, if you look at the, the statistics, Vic, I had no business going pro after that. Um, but I've always thrived on doing things a bit different. I've always thrived on on seeing, you know what, I, I believe enough in my abilities to do so. And so after training a bit with Millsborough, admittedly, with under 23s, just to keep in, in shape, I went to New Zealand to play. Um, yeah, and it was I was going to mention this. Now, this is because of the influence of a, a German keeper. Now, please, if I've got this wrong, I apologise. But Lutz yeah. Fannenstiel, is that right? Yeah, that's sehr gut. Yeah. <laughs> now... <laughs> He's a German goalkeeper who's played on all continents. Is that right? And he inspired yeah. you to do this. Is this correct? Yeah. 
No, but that's a, it's a good research from you. And it's, it's true in the sense that he has this book, an autobiography, and he was the first player to play professionally on all six continents. Um, because I, he says, you know, Greenland is in there wanting to play there, what have you. But his journey is a fascinating one. And I remember reading about him in 442 and reading this story. I said, Dad, you've seen this. And he, incidentally, one of his clubs were in Norway. It was my boyhood club. The, the, the club I played for since I was 12 till I was 20. So the path story started there and dad had played in Germany and, and what have you. So we, my dad had had a relationship with him after that and said, oh, cool story, blah, blah, blah. And then I, as the, similar to what I did with going to America, I thought, wow, I'm fortunate enough to be good enough, at least in football, to try and see the world. And that's my way to do it. And so when I was faced with the uh, kind of the prospect of, you know, going safer and playing back in Norway or, or England and, and building up career from, you know, the lower leagues. I thought, no, I'd love to do New Zealand. Why not? I don't know anything about New Zealand. Um, and as such, they had an Irish coach and he was very forthcoming and very honest and made it really professional. And I played there for seven months. Um, and um, yeah, it's one of those where I can look back and I can say I have friends and call New Zealand a home which I would never would have been able to do without football. So, um, yeah, it was a, it's a fantastic uh, kind of journey. And then Lutz Fanish was a, a kind of a, a partly an inspiration there. I, didn't, I wasn't unfortunately able to play on all five continents, but, um, but alas, I did have at least. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, that was at Southern United. But we yeah. should say you're at Duke College or Duke College. I don't know which way yeah. you want to say it. But... Let's go back to Seattle Sounders because many people might not know about this. I've been lucky to watch them play, and, and that that's a football mad city, isn't it? New York Red Bulls, magnificent new stadium as well, um, in, in near New Jersey, brilliant stuff. I mean, let's talk about the MLS. It's not Mickey Mouse anymore, is it? This is proper football, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, the Seattle Sounders at the time had just won the MLS championship, and they are one of the more consistent and uh, yeah, consistent, most well-run clubs. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, I was being able to, to be in a, in a draft system, which you only really see in movies. And I found myself, and I think that was a benefit of coming from the outside, is that I found myself at this part of this college experience, both socially, academically, and athletically, where you really were able to appreciate what was given to you. You know, these facilities, and I've been fortunate enough in my job now with the PFA to, to go to various Premier League setups and... Uh, well, all through my upbringing, through my dad, through various um, exposure, and it was right up there. And so I was able to have kind of a bit of both and then being able to be part of, you know, MLS system and the draft system. Yeah, you felt we're out of a movie and I was suddenly found myself training with the likes of a, of a Clint Dempsey, for instance, who was still there and, and being able to play with some really, really good players. And so... Um, yeah, MLS is certainly growing and I find it, uh, yeah, it's exciting. It's exciting to see where we'll go and especially now with the World Cup in 2026. I think that is a real um, marker for where the game will go in that country. Have they got a shot at it, do you think, the US? No, I don't think they have a shot, but they can make a run. You know, I, I think you see the other countries, you see Morocco being able to do it. But America has so many athletes. I always say this, when I played in Scotland, New Zealand, Norway, what have you, I played against different profile players, but I would never play against more athletic players than in America. It's just a matter of how do you channel that when you have two, three, four different rivaling sports, if you know. Now, how difficult is it being the son of a footballing father? And, you know, that's a question I guess you're asked all the time. As you said, young Arge Fjortoft is a legend in Swindon, Middlesbrough, Sheffield United, Barnsley, wherever he goes. But... How difficult is that? Or do you just live with it and own it and, and carry on? How, how did you approach that? It's a fair question because I think you have different answers depending on, on who they are and, who, and, and having parents that have played. Um, for me, um, I mean that honestly. And I would have said it honestly because I, I think I am a rather honest person, but I've never felt really the pressure of that. And maybe it's because I've been uh, ignorant of it or, you know, but I've never thought I had to live up to it because I knew how special it is to get a career in the first place. I know how hard it is. And I think I've, that served me well when, when you're that close to the game. I also know what it takes. 
And so I'm not dis- delusional about it being a, a, a God-given right for me to also play and for me to also step foot in the same stadiums, play World Cups, uh, be a Swindon Town legend, what have you. It takes a lot. Um, and the stats show that as well. You know, the 0.0001% play Premier League football. So for me, it was always a matter of playing and being the best I could be. And then, as my dad always said, it was it's, everything's a consequence of the work you put in. Um, and he was never overbearing and pushing me to the drive had to come from here. And so then everything became a natural byproduct of the work I did and circumstances dictate. But no, mo- overbearingly positive. Never felt I've, I've had to kind of prove myself because I was his, uh, his son. You you also sort of glossed over your education, but I'm just looking at this. A scholarship combining football and a bachelor's degree in cultural anthropology and then a master's in business at Dukes in North Carolina. So education was obviously very, very important to you. Yeah, I don't think my mum would have let my dad uh, either, even if he wanted to, but the education was always uh, primary because with what I just said, my dad was never to want to lay, say, to not follow my dreams. He's always allowed me to do that. And when I was 25 and technically signed my first pro contract, I think is a proof of, of such, which he's been my biggest supporter. But I think it's important to realize also that having an education on the side helps. And for me, I don't think it is a detriment to your career. Actually, for me, at least, I thought it was, it helped my career. Um, I think you're able to put things in more perspective as such. But even if you do make it, there is, you know, you talk about players retiring at 35. Mm-hmm. In most careers, that's the start of a career, yeah. you know? So um, I was always very conscious of that from people telling me, but also knowing myself that the right thing for me to do was to have something as well on the side. And I'm very, I'm very glad I did. Well, we've got some messages coming in already. This from Malcolm. Evening all. Marcus, it was wonderful to meet you after the charity match, for which you very kindly signed my shirt. It was great to see you score at the county ground and do the airplane. Such a gentleman. There you go. Yeah, well, that's uh, nice. That was nice and, to see you, Malcolm. And Sharon says, Marcus is an absolute gent, just like his dad. So I think you're getting the messages. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gerald says, like his dad, nice people. So you, you know. Well, that's nice to hear. That's you're nice among hear. friends. You're among yeah, friends. Yeah. No, that's nice to hear. That's, uh, yeah, raised well, I guess. <laughs> How is the college system? Uh, because it's a slightly, it, it's a very, well, of course, it's a foreign system to us, but it is a foreign system to us. How is it? How does it work? Well, from a football perspective, you were yeah. asking, yeah. Um, it's one of those where, and they're changing it now, but a season is merely in the fall. Uh, spring is uh, for it was set up that way so people could focus on their education more in the spring to 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 be perfectly honest with you I didn't I didn't mind it um it was very busy while we played but um basically the setup being is that you are in a conference and you play non-conference games on Friday you play conference games on Tuesday you play non-conference games now all these results play into a national ranking depending on your national ranking you are qualified for the NCAA, which is the, like the FA, but in American college. Uh, and you go to um, a knockout system. And for those more or less familiar with the March Madness with college basketball, which is in of itself a big, big business, you have, I reckon, 64 teams and it's just a knockout system. And so that's ultimately what you're, you're working yourself towards. Um, I only got as close to the Sweet 16, uh, which is the last 16, obviously. Um, but we were number one to five in the country. So I, I was fortunate enough to be able to play at the very upper echelons of, of the college system and play against players that now I see in the MLS. I've seen them in the Scottish Premiership. Uh, Jack Harrison, who played for Leeds, played in my safe, same conference for a year there. So, um, yeah, you play against a lot of good players, and I think you alluded to it there. It is with MLS even, but it's gaining notoriety, it's credibility, legitimacy. Um, it's not like you go to America and it's a free for all in a way, um, and that's to do with the growth of the game as well. Yeah, of course uh, they have similar systems, I guess, in baseball, American football, all that kind of yeah. thing, don't they? Yeah. Uh, so from there, then uh, you do the New Zealand thing, and then of course Scotland comes into your life. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, the mighty Hamilton Academical, if we've mentioned there, we should say, of course, MVPs came your way during your American career. We, we've missed this out. So there were one or two MVPs for you there as well, weren't they? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I was able to, um, I was able to, uh, yeah, do pretty well for my for my college, obviously. But um, yeah, I was able to do that, and, and especially my senior year, where um, where we really established ourselves as one of the better teams in the country, and as such, with a team success comes also individual success. So, which was nice. Um, and also, before my senior year, I, I knew that um, I really had to give it a shot. In terms of like, okay, we we've our our results the last three years have been mediocre. I need to give this a shot. So I spent the year, the summer in America, um, playing for the New York Red Bulls under 23s, and as such, were able to train with the Red Bull first team a couple on a couple of occasions. And Jesse March was coach at the time, and I was able to get that exposure. But I was really consumed and on, on on being as best possible. And I remember having that conversation with my dad, and he says, "Don't think." Several steps ahead. Just think now you're going to be the best player for New York Red Bulls. And I was able to earn, you know, uh, be captain for them and establish and train with the first team. And I was like, oh, great. Okay, now you go into the season and be as best possible there. And I thought, okay. And then I, you know, I got, we did well and I earned accolades. And so everything was a step by step. And that's how I treated my career as well. It wasn't something I had planned in my mind. Go to New Zealand and then go to Scotland. It was like, okay. And then when I came to New Zealand, I was like, okay, well, I still want to continue playing. What, what now? And so everything I feel like has been a natural byproduct of, of me doing the preliminary steps right. Hamilton, then, how did they come into your life? Because, um, you know, Southern United in New Zealand to Hamilton, yeah. although there is a Hamilton in New Zealand, clearly. Um, yeah. uh, how, did that, how did that happen? I had a, a good friend of mine who I played with in, in Scott, um, a Duke, who was Scottish. And um, he was a bit younger than me. But when I left Duke, he took over my position. He had to fill in. Someone had to fill the boots, I guess. And uh, he was just recently become a center back. And I saw him after he'd signed, uh, was done at Duke. He signed for Falkirk in the championship. Falkirk, if you do not know or know, you probably will more than, more than most. But a, a good, passionate fan base. But we're struggling. But even still, he did well. Um, and friends are there for, you, without too much comparison, you think, okay, if he could play there, I can play there, right? I thought. And so I reached out to his father, who was an agent, and he did me a massive favor. And he fixed me a trial with Hamilton. And this was in March, April, where you don't really do trials. But nonetheless, I was able to uh, have a trial with them. And I was given three weeks. And for a footballer, it's tough when you're on trial because often they give, I've been on trials and they give you one to two days. Vic, it's really hard to make an impression of what you do. Things have to, you have to settle in. Maybe you have a great session, which could work in your favor, but sometimes it takes time. So for me, it was a pretty remarkable step from New Zealand to Scotland. You're playing the Scottish Premiership. And so it took me some while and, and what have you. And I'll always be very thankful for Brian Rice who gave me the uh, the chance when you looked at my profile? I was 25 years old. I played in college, played in New Zealand, relatively unknown. And so, for him to offer me a contract then and 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 give me the chance of what turned out to be three years in Scotland is something that uh, I'll be very grateful for. It, it's um it's a club, of course, which is in the shadow of, of the Glasgow Giants, isn't it? And I remember going there once to see them play Aberdeen, and there were like two men and a dog there. And then on the station next to the ground, it, or the yeah. platform was full of Celtic and Rangers fans. It's it that's the problem they face, isn't it? Yeah, it's a small club in a or when you compete with the two, with the, yeah, with Celtic and Rangers. And as you know, Celtic and Rangers, I mean, sell at least some of the biggest clubs in 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 the United Kingdom. So. Um, yeah, it was one of those, but it was a perfect place for me to go where club, as a club, the profile was rel an underdog, relatively unknown with everything to prove, and, and as was I. And as such, they recruited players who had that similar, um, yeah, similar drive, similar profile. And so for me, it was a massive transition. And I always say that I was 25, yes, but from experience standpoint, from the professional level, I was like an 18-year-old. Because my exposure hadn't been to playing at Hearts away or against playing in Celtic Rangers. So for me, I've always been a late bloomer. And I say that proudly because I think there, it goes to show that there are diff different development trajectories. But for me, it was a massive step up going there. But after, with time, you get used to it. But it takes time. And there's no way to kind of accelerate that process. It's just through cold, hard exposure. And I learned that both you know, the good and the bad way. 
Uh, you, you dented the Scottish too. You just sort of Granite Morton and, and Air United, of course, who also missed out on the playoffs uh, this week, didn't they? Uh, in uh, the championship, in terms of, uh, I think they, I can't remember, did they get relegated or stay up? They stayed up. They didn't go up to the Premier League. That's that's what's happened to Air. Um, they beat by Party Thistle. So Greenwich and Morton. So how, how did you kind of continue that little tour of Scotland? How did that all happen? Yeah. I mean, I was fortunate enough to get in before Brexit, so I had my visa sorted, so I was able to actually stay in the country. Um, but it was one of those when faced with the prospect of facing, you know, variable amount of chances at, at, at Aki's when I got back. And to be fair, when I came back the second season, I felt like a different type of player because it was to do with experience. It's to do with your job for anyone listening. If they've been in a job and they've been there for a year, they're better when they come back the second year. That's how it is. And so for me, I... I felt I had a diff different kind of confidence, a different kind of assertion in, in, in how I, I felt like I belonged rather than, you know, I thought I deserved opportunities rather than the first year I was hoping, which uh, is a key difference. Um, and, but when I came back, it was kind of given chances, not given chances. And I, I thought, I don't know how long I'm going to play for. I always knew since I got to, uh, to Aki's, I knew I wasn't going to play till I was 35. I knew that. So I thought, how do I maximize this? And so, I made the decision of going down to the championship with better better belief that I would play regularly, which which I did. Um, signed by David Hopkin, who used to play for for Chelsea, uh, for Palace, and he signed me there. Um, and I'm glad I did. And he signed me for Air as well. Unfortunately, I had to leave a bit earlier on both occasions. But um, even still, it was um, yeah, it was a level that suited me, and um, yeah. I was, I was after three years, I felt good, but um, yeah, three fulfilling years. And another sort of court culture, I guess. I mean, like, we're all part of the United Kingdom, but Scottish culture, as we know, much different to English culture. Uh, I mean, you're learning this all the time, and, and you've got cultural anthropology. Now, I'm not clever enough to know what that is, but what is that? <laughs> no, well, it's, I mean, it's on that topic. I mean, it, it, the reason I did that is. Did it has a unless you want to become anthropologist, maybe you think, oh, what's this relevant for? But it's a, it's a, it is a study of culture. You can it's an open ended kind of study in which you're able to see the underpinning foundations of what makes a culture, culture, a country, a country. And it's a good segue because Scotland and England is different, and there are many similarities, but Scots are very different from the English, and, and even seeing within a changing room as well, the dynamics. And for English, especially those Southern, South English coming up, it was a lot bigger of a, a, a difference than if a Scouser would come up or a Geordie would come up. It was, it was just a different way of, of going by things. But what I found very liberating what i love about the scots is and the same goes for the english to be fair but this just this absolute uh letting go of taking yourself seriously and and and, and as such making people feel uncomfortable yes it's a sink or swim environment in a football changing room but even still um for me to be able to embrace that and be able to call scotland home it's a place i i love and i love the people uh as such too so for me it's that's also the reward of playing abroad is that I get to have a little sprinkle of that as part of my identity, if you may, or my, ex or my experience. So um, yeah, very thankful for that. Sure. Um, uh, this is from Ian. He says, hi, Marcus. I'm a Darlington F uh, FC fan. Uh, did Jose Quintongo play for Hamilton? Do you know the name? Quintongo. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that name. I heard uh, Jai Quintongo. Who signed a coincidentally an extension with Morton today? But there are two, I believe. So um, I've I've heard. I think it's maybe the same guy. Yeah, let's go. With the answer yes. I think that might be. Yeah, you we'll do that. And you can, <laughs> yeah, we'll you can that. tweet at me, and then I can clarify uh, the detail. Okay, fair enough. And of course, there are different surfaces in Scotland as well, aren't there? I mean, ha Hamilton's got a, an artificial surface. Yeah. But they seem to embrace that in Scotland, where they don't in England. Which is a, a, a what's your view on that? Um, I mean, I think it's always different, two different types of football being played on those surfaces. Norway has a lot of it because of conditions, because yeah. of economics. It's probably the same for, for a club like Aki's or, or, or other clubs at that. But it's different types of football being played. And there was an argument of making Norway, Norway's national stadium artificial. 
stupidest idea ever because you, you aren't competing on the similar grounds. And so how are you going to compete with the best national teams? Um, yeah, abroad too. I grew up on it. I love playing on it, but I also realize that it's a different type of football. The touch, the way it bounces is, um, is different. So did Swindon play much of a part in your life at this stage? I mean, you're presumably aware where you're born, obviously, but were you aware of the town's results? Did you follow them? Um, I'm, I'm, you know, you're globe trotting around the world, for goodness sake, and playing for other yeah. clubs. But did it ever play a part at that stage? Yeah, I mean, I always have a little, have a little eye for it. I think when you come to the UK, however, you follow it more closely, and when also when you're part of that same football family. Um, and so for me, being able to see that, you know, it's been a rough few years as well at that, and following also the 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 management of the club and what have you. It's something that I've been engaged with really properly for the last um yeah i say three four years coincidentally when i came back to the to the back to the uk and then now being able to follow that more closely now as well and being really immersed in terms of results and how it's going the ins and outs um yeah it's something that i relish and i have been able to commentate commentate on as well um you get kind of a different way of seeing as well because then it's not just following results but also analyzing what's going right what's going wrong when the games are being played as well. Well, I know you've got a lot of uh, people sort of giving you a lot of credit for the, the way you co-commentated Andrew Halls, which, again, must be very nice. The fact that you analyse the game in a way that people understand and That's can follow, nice. which, you know, you, you should take that as a compliment. But Absolutely. then you come to the point of retiring at 28, which now, for most of us, would say, well, hang on a minute, that is very young. So why, why the decision to, to retire at 28? Well, I don't want to, without avoiding sounding too philosophical, but for me, I've always had this, I've always had this feeling of when things feel right and when things feel wrong and being, and saying, oh, no, this is a bit too much, too premature to do, or this is a bit too belated to do, what have you. I was fearing that um, if I'd stayed another year, I would have kind of stagnated. If stayed at the same level or, you know, doing the same. And it's not that it wasn't a good life as such, but uh, there are circumstances that dictate and um, you have people that you, you know, you have a partner and what have you. But at the, ultimately, it came down to me and what I felt was right. And I was fortunate enough, as we have discussed, to have an education as well at that. And I thought, to be fair, I could have continued and I had offers and, and what have you. But I thought, no, there was something in me that thought I would stagnate and it wouldn't be so much. I don't know, from a football wise, I think if I stayed on and played for three, four years, and I don't want to sound too with too much hindsight and saying, oh, I could have been this because it's the worst. Say I could have, would have, should have. But I've always been a late bloomer. And I knew that the more experience I get, the better I get. I, I knew that. But um, no, I felt like I wanted to pursue a different career where maybe I could go beyond the ceiling I perhaps would envision I'd reach in in a couple of years. And, and to be fair with you, um, that was the right decision. I don't. It's a, it's been a year now since I retired, and I don't miss it as such. I love being involved with football, but I also know what it requires. See the swimming players when they get ready, and I've watched them play a few games now. I also know what it requires to play and get ready. And pardon my French, but the, the crap you had to go through as well. Mm-hmm. And then having said that, those five percent when you score or win a game and you celebrate with the town fans or whatever. It's the best feeling in the world and nothing can replicate that. But um, at one point there, the maths didn't add up for me. And I thought, no, I'd rather have a different role within football. I I was going to ask if you missed the buzz, but because footballers say when they retire, there is nothing to replicate that feeling of playing the game. I mean, I know a lot go into management um, and maybe some go into journalism like your dad's done, but... There, there is nothing to replicate that com- comradeship in the in the dressing room, all that kind of thing. So, do you miss that at all, or is that now a part of your life which is gone, and you put it into into a box and you've moved on? No, I I, I miss I miss the uh, the camaraderie and and, and the changing room, of course. I just I think the older I've gotten, the more rational, more pragmatic I've gotten, and so I know that I can't have that without the other, and so I know that. Um, yeah, of course, I would love to experience this again, but I'm like that, but that's not how it works. And so I'm able to, I'm very much able to say, okay, that was a part of my life. Um, and then being able to to move on uh, 
uh, as such. Fair enough. So what about your roles now? Because I mentioned earlier the, the, the German podcast and, and the, the one that I, I listened to a little earlier, which is fascinating about the Oliver Kahn situation. You do a regular podcast regarding German football, which, as I said, had a quite extraordinary ending to the campaign on Saturday, did it not? With Dortmund looking odds on favourites to take the Bundesliga and guess what? Bayern Munich win it. <laughs> what a shocker. Uh, so, what you know, tell us about German football and how that is. Because, as you know, over here, we've suffered at the hands of the Germans in football matches over the years. Yeah. Uh, what is the state of the Bundesliga at the minute? Well, it is. I mean, from a, the simplified version of the German Bundesliga, from an English perspective, it's, it was the Farmers League, right? And that's I, I can see now that Bayern winning their 11th consecutive title, it has that problem with that image. But I... I think the Bundesliga is so much more than that. Um, and it has a fan culture and the, the, the finances in place there when it comes to ticketing and, and that fan culture that follows is something I think English fans would envy because it has that feel to it that the way we romanticize football should have to it. Um, that's one thing. And then you can say in terms of the title run in this season at the very least was one in which pretty much all titles were done and dusted, except for the Bundesliga. And then you have Bayern Munich that are bigger than the rest, and it's un undoubtable. And now you see a lot of clubs in different leagues being the same. But you have this drama, and my dad and I were discussing it today, is yes, the Premier League had drama. Um, it did, or the last game of the season, and, and, and so the playoff games for that matter, which in and of itself is fantastic. But the Bundesliga always seems to have this... Um, this drama to it and this these narratives to it that I, for one, very much am able to appreciate and in many ways romanticize. It's part of this bygone era, if you may. And so now you have a Union Berlin going to the to play Champions League and they were not even in the Bundesliga five years ago. You have the likes of Schalke and Hertha Berlin going down and two clubs, I'm sure none of the listeners know, are Heidenheim and Darmstadt going up. And I think football, where we criticize the predictability of it, because of money will dictate and what have you, you're able to get that. And to be fair, you're able to get that in England now as well. I think it's fantastic that some, a club like Luton Town are able to go yeah. up. And what a fantastic yeah. inspiration that is for other clubs, like a Swindon Town, to show yeah. that it's possible. So I think these stories and clubs and narratives, I think, are important to embrace and, and, and kind of welcome. And so with the Bundesliga as well, it's, um, yeah... It is. I would recommend it strongly, and I've been able to follow it closely over this last year with my dad and being able to do that together. And coincidentally, today was 24 years since he scored that vital goal that kept Eintracht Frankfurt in the in the Bundes, Bundesliga and kind of cemented him as part of Bundesliga history, I guess. Incredible. I, uh, yeah, it's amazing, really. I, I was talking about this to somebody the other day about how we all would have liked to have felt like Luton Town fans did on Saturday night. All right, the realism of the Premier League will kick in later. Yeah. But that moment, it's like Swindon 30 years ago beating Leicester in that pl incredible playoff final. Mm -hmm. That feeling, if you could put it in a bottle and sell it in the club shop, would fly off the shelves, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And But also as a fan, I was mentioning kind of the, 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 the highs and the lows. I mean, for fans as well, like it's those moments that make... What is life, really, if not those moments where, especially as football as well, which is so such a communal thing where you celebrate with others as well. That feeling right there is what you as a fan are kind of always searching for. Um, and so, yeah, we'll see. I mean, Swindon have a, Swindon down have a, have a long road ahead of that, but I think it just goes to show that granted there is right management, right structure in place, which is important. It's not all we only come down to the coach. It's, it's the overall structure. Um, yeah, then, then things are possible. More comments coming in. Uh, this is from Andrew Garrett. Hi, Andy. Very interesting to hear him talk about his time in Scottish football and how he came through this college system in the USA. He certainly had a very different type of football career than a player in this country. And I think that's the thing <laughs> that struck me when I was sort of researching this yesterday, thinking, my goodness me, that's not a bad life. I mean, that is an experience that, my gosh, when you get to my dotage, you'll be able yeah. to look back on and think, wow, that, that was OK. I enjoyed that. I mean... When did you make the decision to do that podcast with your dad? Because, you're, I mean, as we've seen your dad jetting around the countries, doing the Premier League, doing the Champions League, blah, blah, blah. 
he is now sort of a full-blown journalist. I mean, when did you sort of come to that uh, sort of stage? Yeah, I think it's something that we came to together in the sense that what I always say about football is a lot of free time, but not a lot of freedom. And so what I relished about this new phase, if I call myself, my new career, is that I've been able to pursue things creatively and conceptually the way that I've wanted. I'm able to go places and I'm able to pursue that. And to be fair, I did a podcast while I played because I needed that stimuli. Um, God, it's exhausting identifying yourself as only a footballer while you play because the highs and the lows, if you do that, I, I yeah, it becomes it becomes all-consuming and too exhausting, in my opinion. So I had experience within it. And for my dad, who was able to now conclude his first year of pitch side in the Premier League, uh, because they got the rights for it, which thereby removed him from the Bundesliga, which he'd done for the last few years, is a way for him to stay connected. And so for us to be able to do that together is sort of a start of a, of a venture, I think, I know we would like to continue um, doing a family business type of thing. And that's a start of it, to be able to work together. Um, and it's a good way for us to, to you know, to be in contact uh, on the regular, which we always are naturally, but even still be able to talk about football, the Bundesliga, um, yeah, and, and the league in general. Yeah, I was listening to the episode about Oliver Kahn and thinking, my goodness me, we think politics in football in this country is complicated, but boy, oh boy, in Germany, yeah. wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you guys are privy to like your own set of drama in the, in the upper, you know, in the executive level with Swindon, I know, you know, but it's funny with the Bundesliga, it's a lot more public and especially a club like Bayern Munich, it's 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 this different kind of entity. It's more than and it's more than a football club. It's this whole business and people. And like I said, in, in German clubs there are spies, so it's just more natural. And, and, the, and the the sporting director and the CEOs they are a lot more public figures than they are in England. And sometimes I do miss. And I was fortunate enough to sit down with the Ipswich CEO, Mark Ashton. But that was one of those rare cases where I knew that, wow, like I'm actually able to sit down with a CEO of a club and talk to him. I reckon if you we went through the CEOs of the most English clubs, I would struggle to, 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 to name even a few such because they're a lot more or less visible than the Bundesliga, which also makes it very interesting, that dynamic between sporting director and coach and what have you. The politics are, are, are so different. and You're a lot more publicly scrutinized. You work with the PFA. Tell us about that. And how did that come about? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I was, admittedly, when I stopped playing, which I knew was the right decision, still looking for a job, still going through job interviews and and, and realizing that I have to be someone else than a footballer, which I had an utmost confidence in. But until you actually get a job, you don't know quite how that looks like. And so I for, was fortunate enough to have a, a friend of mine who I played with in New Zealand who did a bit of work for them, who introduced me to, to the, uh, the opportunity. And uh, after having initial talks with them, they created a kind of different role for me than initially advertised, uh, in which I'm able to do a lot of the media stuff and, uh, and one in which they're looking to create because they didn't have anyone at the time. And so I've been very fortunate enough to enjoy the trust from them in which I'm able to pursue projects I think are worth doing uh, as, as well as, and most importantly, uh, showing the work of the PFA. And for people who don't know what the PFA does until you're, I guess, what we want to do is show the stories as best possible. How do you tell the most compelling story to show what the PFA does? And the PFA's work is pretty impressive. It's just a matter of how to tell it, how to tell it most effectively, and how it does it reach the most amount of people. But as such, I've been able to speak to a lot of cool people, whether it's to do with coaching, business, um, you know, equality, uh, brain health, it's its everything. And as such, I get a pretty broad exposure into it. What have you learned about the business of football? Because, you know, as fans, we go along, we see 22 players kick a ball about and then we go away miserable or happy, one of the two, or bored sometimes. You must have seen some swimming games where you thought, hmm. <laughs> not yeah. the most exciting encounters this season. Um, but what have you learned about the business side of it? Because... It's a tough dog-eat-dog -dog business, isn't it? And, you know, clubs are surviving. They're scrapping for every penny. What have you learned about it? Well, it is. it is. It's tough. And if I was an owner and we we had enough money to buy a club, I'm not sure I would because it is, it is tough. And you're also, 
we're entering an age in which a club is more than just a football club. Um, and some fans like that, others don't, but that's ultimately they will say that, well, the work we do commercially, uh, you know, partnerships, digitally, whatever, is part of funneling the money back into the club. But you're dealing with these big entities. And that's why we discuss when making the connection to the Oliver Kahn. He's a former player, yes, but he's not. A, he's Just because he's a former player and taking some courses doesn't mean he's a CEO. Because a CEO is, you're not really, you're not running sporting operations necessarily. And so it depends what a club is. Tottenham are a prime example of what I think are do everything right, except for the sporting bits. And I say that maybe a bit subjectively because I'm an Arsenal fan, but stadium is fantastic partnerships are fantastic commercially but it's finding that balance between doing that and ultimately what the main priority of a club is which is sporting results and so it is a tough tough ask but one i find very fascinating because even though the commercial endeavors are a different concept to a football club than it was before still very exciting as to what you can create because i think the opportunities then are endless, but still within bearing in mind what is the main priority of a club, and that is on the pitch. It's what happens on that green bit every Saturday, isn't it? I mean, that's what exactly. it's ultimately about. I mean, you can talk about marketing, all this, that kind of things and the other, but, you know, it's what you do on the pitch on a Saturday, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And then it's, you know, some things are more tangible than others. Some things you can, you can measure uh, more so than others in terms of, what does building a brand for a club, well, would, that, would that mean that more players will come and will that mean it make it more attractive for fans to come and more money will come? It's hard to con- criticize these things, but I think if you do the little things right, it will add up onto the pitch. But um, also on that note, the business of sports, we have to realize, I think th- many of these people running it, you look at them and you think, what are these decisions being made? Whether it was the, the Super League, and thinking how they manage that. And you realize that, yeah, there are a lot of great people running football clubs, but then there are also people that less so. There's a great program, I don't know if you've seen it, called Ted Lasso, uh, which is yes. currently on TV. <laughs> and they did an episode really, which, which was based on the European Super League, which uh, recently, and, it, you know, it showed the preposterousness, if there is such a word, of that situation. I mean, is that dead and buried, the European Super League, or is that going to come back in some gruesome form at some point i think they do but they will do so more subtly and they will do so in ways that are uh less conspicuous in the sense that you see the new champions league format is structured in a way that favors clubs legacies um and as such and and changing the format and and making it more increasingly likely that the bigger clubs will make it to the knockout rounds you know if we think uh of it's great that the likes of a loot and go down and no up and, and what have you, but broadcast commercially, you know, for these people that have interest in them, it's not so good, you know. Yeah. The same with the Bundesliga now with the two big clubs going down. So there, yeah, well, I don't think I don't think we are either, but naive to the to kind of yeah the business interests in mind there. So I don't think it be, I don't think it will come back in that original format, but I think it will come back in slow little drips. Interesting, because, you know, with all due respect, Luton versus Brighton ain't going to cut it in the Middle East, is it, really? Do you know what no. I mean? It's not no, going to draw the big it's audiences. Not true, though. It's nothing to do with the clubs. It's just that's yeah. facts. So yeah. I'm just saying that, and I think you understand where I'm coming from, is that there are interest groups there in mind that will, yeah, want the best product. You see the new Club World Cup introduced but then, as we in the PFA also, one of our main priorities here is fixture congestion. Because you press more and more games, the irony or the paradox, whatever you might call it, is that the more games you fit, the, the worse the product will be because the players won't be for, performing at the same level that, you're, that you, you'd hope for. You know, you're sending them to preseason tours there and what have you. Understand there are certain commercial obligations. But if it goes too far, the, the players were ultimately the, the product will we'll suffer. So if we had a mid-season break and then they went on tour of the United States playing several games, it wouldn't really be much point in that, but it, it's that sort of a, a situation, isn't it? Um, yeah. A couple of questions here. This is from James. He's got a couple, actually. Uh, hi, Marcus. Does your dad still follow our results? And 
What about a father and son management team at Swindon one day? I mean, let's go to the management one first and foremost. Is that something you wouldn't touch with anyone's barge pole? I kind of guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, I respect people who do management. And my dad will always say if he was on, he said that he would give you the statistics of when he was manager, when he was interim manager, because as sporting director, the manager had been removed and whatnot. And I think he'd never, he'd never lost. Um, but I think we both agreed that we'd have to hire a very good tactician and a first team coach. Um, absolutely. But uh, I think he would be a good man to manager at that, that he always had, he always had that in him. That's always been his strength. I think the the EQ um, even in his job now, but uh, yeah, follows his result. Absolutely. He always does. And I know he has that marked all the old clubs he has marked um, to, 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 to follow them. And um, yeah, I won't go into who against who and what have you, but uh, no, that's always been a, uh, yeah invaluable parts of yeah his football journey so what about the media for you because obviously you help out Halsey um excellent chap that yes. he is uh, yeah. with his excellent purple hat uh, which we <laughs> love a lot obviously <laughs> I mean uh, how have you found that I mean did you have any experience before radio work how did it all work for you no I was really fortunate that Andrew reached out because I, will, I always say this jokingly but I said I don't know I don't know what I don't know what I want to be when I grow up yet, I say, jokingly. But in the sense that I've always believed in in doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and being able to think that, okay, at some point it will connect. And I think my career or life so far has, has proven that one fits into the other. It's just a matter of time showing opportunity and what have you. But when Andrew reached out, I'd never done anything of the kind. And I always say being a main commentator is a really tough task. And I told him that after the first time I said what you do as a main commentator where you have to steadily and smoothly narrate through an entire match I could never do but it gives me time when he's talking for me to analyze the game and it was cool for me to be able to there's a difference between like watching a game and watching a game mm. and so for me as co-commentary I have to I have to find my voice I have to find my role what am I contributing here and Andrew just gave me just two tips. He said, when it's in the in around the 18-yard box, you can leave it to me, um, and I'll explain the what's happening, and you explain the why. Hmm. Um, and so I thought, okay, that's a good. That was a good base for me to then grow into that role. And do I do I think I could better? Absolutely, absolutely. But I've enjoyed trying to analyze the game I've always played from a different um, vantage point. I was lucky enough many times to commentate with the, the great Ken Furphy, who was manager of Watford, Sheffield United, New York Cosmos, in fact, no. and people like that. And the one thing you realise is when you're commentating with somebody like that, how little you know about the game of football, because <laughs> he sees things four moves ahead of you did, of what yeah. you did. And, you know, being an analyst, it's able to pick the bones out of a game, isn't it? And, and if you've played professionally, you know what a professional player is going through. Is it? Sometimes are people too critical? Do they not understand? How would you say that? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because when you are, I've always been careful, like criticizing players too heavily because you don't really know until you're in the situation. You also know that even the players at the highest level won't play a perfect game. So you don't want to be too critical when and acting in hindsight because it's very easy to, to act in hindsight, to analyze in hindsight. But at the same time, you need to frame a picture for, for the listener. Um, and I know I have so much more football to know. I'm so fascinated when I speak to these managers and ask them about. And I was fortunate enough, and I, I allow me to name drop because he was my hero growing up, but I sat down with Cesc Fabregas. And the way he sees the game, I'm in awe by, you know, because they have a total different obsession to, to the game. And so the, what I best can do is just follow my curiosity and they kind of ask them the open-ended questions. Um, but that certainly plays a part in when you do commentary or, or, or what have you is why they do the things they do. How does that look? Why did they do that? Um, and I can relay that from my experience, especially from a center back's perspective. Um, but it's something that like I relish trying to think more about the game more actively rather than just watching. You're on holiday at the minute. And we're, again, we're very grateful that you've taken time out to, to do this for us. So we're really pleased no about worries. that. Um, so what happens now? You, you, you go back to work. Um, how busy is it in the summer? Does it start? What happens? 
I actually, I don't know actually how busy it will be summer, but I like staying busy as well. Um, I've got my own company that I run and I do a diff various different projects there. And I'm always looking for, for other things to do as well um, from, yeah, personally as well, as much as professionally um, with the PFA. So I kind of relish the fact that the, no matter what that summer will look like, I also, it's also the PFA's 50th awards uh, the anniversary for the awards um, this season. So we have a lot of work prepping into that. And I've been able to speak to some absolute legends of the game, players that are of your era and that have been in my father's era. And being able to speak to them too is, is really great for me to be able to touch on to that football legacy of English football. Yes, it's great. It's great to meet with the Steve Gerrard and the Thierry Henrys and and the most Salas and De Bruyne, but also to be able to speak to, well, Colin Todd and Peter Reed and Lineker and, uh, yeah, the likes, uh, Pat Jennings. That's what I also find incredibly rewarding about my job. So I'll be pretty busy with that this summer. Well, that's good to know. And uh, are we going to see you at the county ground regularly next season, would you say? is that? I hope so. Just if Andrew hears this, he says, don't hesitate, and I'll be there uh, <laughs> to commentate. But yeah, it's something I would love to do. I love the challenge of it. And it's always great for me to meet, you know, going to that game and meeting the, you know, people like yourself and others that, um, yeah, I love the club and uh, doing things like this is which keep people engaged and the communal aspect of it as well. So yeah, it's something I would love to continue doing. Well, don't forget, when you're down next time, pop into the Legends Lounge and see us at the Supporters Club table because we like to have a chat. And uh, Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I yeah, love great. To In terms of, of your career, where do you see it progressing? I mean, my goodness, you're 29, for goodness sake. You know, uh, you, <laughs> <laughs> you know what, do you think, see television? Is that a way forward for you? How, how would you see it? I think it's, it's not my main goal, but I would love to do it. And I would love to do a little... Uh, ultimately, my ultimate goal is to... For me to to have my own company and, and and which I do, but to make that profitable for me to run that with my family, and I think our whole family wants to do that. Now, what does that look like? Well, I think by having the different experiences, doing this and doing a little bit of communications and media and marketing and what have you, I'm a firm believer that the dots will connect. That's my life philosophy. I don't have any concrete what will that look like, but the way the same way I was steered in my football career. I can never stagnate. I always have to go like this. And what does that look like? That Well, that depends. You have your version of it. I have mine. But I have that feeling where I'm like, okay, hello, I'm, on, I'm on a steady track in which I feel like I am now. And I felt that retiring was part of it. Even though it was good to be back at County Ground and scoring and what have you, um, I still felt it was the right thing to do. Because the world of media has changed, hasn't it? I mean, my goodness me, since I first started the world of media, you know, you had a piece of string and a cocoa tin. But, I, you know, it's changed so immensely, hasn't it, with things like podcasts, for instance. You know, the world is everybody's um, lobster, as they used to say in France. You know, you can get out there and do whatever you want, can't you? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then I'm not naive to the fact that media is an incredibly competitive business and, you know, most players going out of the career want to you know, think, oh, I'm going to be pandit, blah, blah, blah. So I have nothing... I don't have an overbearing goal of being the pundit, whatever, but I think it's fun to do. Uh, and then I know that that comes with its new opportunities. So it's something I will continue seek, seeking out to do. And then on this journey that we call life, I think, okay, the, the, you know, the, the bits of the puzzle will maybe become clearer and then you maybe are able to accompany, have another role, what have you. But uh, yeah, that is a big question, though, Vic, isn't it? Where where will this lead to? But we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Marcus, thank you very much. It's been an absolute joy. And uh, it's been so fascinating to hear about your life. I mean, I couldn't believe it, really. I mean, my goodness me, the places you played, the things you've done, a 29-year-old, I keep on saying it, my goodness <laughs> me. And, and all we can do is wish you all the very best for the future. And please be a regular at the county ground. We'd be delighted to see you. No, I would love to. And thanks for having me. It's, it's great for me to connect back with the... The swim fan base with people like yourself and meeting you in person after the game as well is uh, I'm glad you do that because for me, I'm incredibly appreciative of being able to reconnect with what is ultimately my birthplace. It is. You're a Swindonian yeah. and yeah. you're proud of it. it I can tell, day, yeah. which is great. Absolutely. Yeah. Marcus, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Thank you very much, Marcus. I echo uh, Vic's words. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, you can have a word in your dad's ear. I will be back on to him to try and find a suitable yes, date for him to come on. <laughs> We've uh, had to cast it a few times, but um, we will get your dad on as well. So yeah, brilliant. Yeah. I'll help Thank you. Out you. That. Uh, good. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and have a have a lovely rest of your holiday in Valencia. Thank so. you. Appreciate it. So. Have a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everybody for watching. Um, we will be back next week. We've got Brian Howard on next week. Um, same time, same place. Um, nine o'clock tonight. Fourth rush in. I've got their end of season presentations, so that should be interesting. So time to have a cuppa and get ready and settle down to watch that. But we will see you all next week. Bye.